Greetings, ladies and managers, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Delphi Station, written by Dr. Mantis Toboggan. Delphi Station, this is Captain Zigram, of the shadowy movement among the backdrop of stars, carrying Her Holiness Listener Mailbrass, reporting that we have successfully translated to Sublight. Welcome, Captain. Data packet four parking coordinates have been transmitted. We'll be over soon to pick up Her Holiness, responded the friendly voice of the station operator. To Zigram's surprise, it took over a second for them to receive the coordinates. Strange, for the race with the greatest prediction power to wait until after the recipient had arrived before sending the data packet. He shrugged. Such musings were above his station. Shortly after, they stopped in an allotted section of space around the station. A small vessel docked with them. The technology employed by the humans once again surprised Zigram. Instead of predicting what kind of tech they would need to make successfully interface the two species airlocks, the humans had simply extended a tube from their shuttle to Zigram's ship, ensuring that it sealed well against his hull and pressurized it. For once, Zigram was happy that protocol demanded him to stay aboard the ship in case the hosts required it to be moved. He did not envy Malbrass's trip between ships, the only thing separating her from the void being a semi-transparent plastic sheet tube. Well, she foretold that he would survive the experience, the thought of it still frightened him. Male Brass put one brave face on as she leapt from the comfortable gravity of a ship through the weightlessness-inducing tube, all the way to the shuttle sent to pick her up. She wasn't sure what kind of game the humans were playing here. Were they forcing her to humiliate herself by testing her with peril, to see if she would crack, or were they declaring that a race as weak as hers had no right to more lavish form of transportation? She pushed these thoughts to the back of her mind as she reached the airlock of the human shuttle. As the outer door closed and oxygen cycled back in, she remembered her mission here. First was to greet the humans, as this was the first meeting between their two civilizations since the end of the war. Second of all was to figure out how the humans surpassed her people. By the orrery, their FTL tech wasn't even a decade old. As the inner door opened, what she saw almost made her heart stop. One helmsman and two cards, all of them with a weapon on their hips. She briefly considered that they were here to assassinate her, and that this whole trip had been a lie. But then she remembered that the orrery and the choir both agreed that she would be safe this trip. She had nothing to worry about, as usual, and was happy to note that the shuttle had started moving towards the station. Hoping the humans didn't notice her fear, she stepped forward. Greetings, I am Listener Malbras. Take me to your leader. Why the selected a chuckle from everyone aboard was a mystery to her. I apologize. Was there a translation error? Uh, no, Listener, there wasn't. It's, uh, well, it's what we always said that the first alien we saw would say that. She nodded. It made sense, given how good their prediction must be. If only she knew how they made them. And how long ago was this prophecy recorded? The soldiers looked at each other for a second before one of them pulled some device from his pocket and tapped it a few times. Says here that it was already a popular saying by the 1960s. About 160 rotations of the planet around the sun ago? Malbras almost voided her bowels. After some mental mathematics, she realized that this was well over a galactic century ago. That she would step aboard the shuttle and say those exact words, she needed to be careful if she was to integrate herself with their predictors and learn how to bring their secrets to her people. A few minutes later, they were docking with a station, allegedly named after one of the humans' greatest oracles. And what a station it was, bigger than a city back in Zybalsha, and absolutely flooded with people. As soon as she stepped out of the shuttle, she was greeted by a host of human soldiers, each pointing a device at her, and for a moment she was rooted in place by a mixture of worry and horror. Then the clicking and flashing started. The devices were like a wall of what humans called flashbangs, albeit much milder, and the clicking was akin to the fleshed weapons used in ritual duels. But instead of being riddled with projectiles of the humans used in war, she was instead treated to a light show, albeit one that slightly hurt if she stared at it. Her two escorts hurried her into an awaiting vehicle, and they moved off as soon as the door was closed. Apologies, listener. We should have warned you about the paparazzi. She simply nodded, unsure of what to make of it. She connected her pad to the station network and looked up the term her escort had used. Then her eyes nearly leapt out of the sockets. 
Apparently, the humans, with all their power, didn't use their precognition on matters other than war. While the general public had known she would arrive today, they didn't know when or where. Apparently, there had been a contest where people paid money to predict where and when she would arrive from, with the winner taking everyone else's money. While such methods were occasionally used to help sell billion children develop their abilities, the fact that adults were doing this seemed off to her. Surely, it must be some kind of remedial class for late bloomers, she thought. After a short drive, they arrived at the government building in charge of the station's bureaucracy. She was escorted through more flashes, and they brought her to a waiting area, where an attendant brought her a tray of drinks. Greetings, leader. I have brought you a selection of drinks, all cleared with your medical staff. Would you care for water, tea, or something stronger? Melbrus was offended by the suggestion that someone of her rank in the choir would ever consume something that would impair her predictions. Accepting the water, she waited for a meeting with the human leader, inspecting a human phrase carved into the wall above the large double doors leading into the office that she was about to be brought into. It wasn't a long wait, and soon she was led into a large and modestly decorated room where the human leader awaited her, alongside some other dignitaries. At least nobody in this room was armed, compared to all the guards she had seen throughout the buildings. Greetings, listener. I am Suresh Nandari, leader of the station. This is President Bupinda Chandahari, leader of the nation of India, the parent state of the station. And these fine people are President Jane Washington of the United States of America, President Lang Jing of Taiwan, Chancellor Hans Michel Schmitz from the European Union. President Elena Vasilovich from the Russian Federation, Chairman Nabayo Haramdi of the Pan-African Coalition, and Hamza Ibn Salim, representative of the Arabic corporate states, and Chairman Alagendro Miguel Iza of the South American League. The listener nodded and tried to remember the names as best she could, before giving up on a fifth person. Thank you. It is my great pleasure to finally meet you all, although this is not the first time our peoples have met. It brings me great joy to greet you all as friends during peacetime rather than wartime. We couldn't agree more, said the mayor to the station. Now we tried to sort out a schedule with your people, but they couldn't give us an exact timetable. Yeah, but this is what we think is best, but please tell us if you disagree. We thought we'd start with some photographs outside, then some speeches followed by some questions from the public if you like. Don't worry, we've screened out anything inappropriate. Melbrus was sure the human was showing off. Not only had they predicted that everyone would ask and invited only the correct people, they'd somehow spent whatever resources necessary to predict the exact time of a speech to make sure the day ran smoothly. This only made the Melbras more envious, as back in Zilbara, she'd simply have been told exactly how long her speech should be. That sounds perfect. Let me know when you're ready to begin. Oh, in a few minutes. We've brought some gifts for you first. But before all of that... One of your guards. Uh, I hope nobody was rude enough not to admit them. My guards? You know, the other Zilbillians, to make sure that you're not harmed or anything. Mumbra struggled to understand the question. I haven't predicted anyone harming me on my trip. Why? Have you? The humans all laughed as if she was joking. Oh, how she hated their laughter at the implication that her predictions were meaningless. She tried to foretell when the best time would be to approach them about perhaps helping her with her prediction methods. Looking through the strands of fate, she found that right now had a good chance of Sezeni. She finally asked the humans, So, how did you know? How did we know what? Asked the pale woman who ruled over the northeastern quadrant. How did you know where exactly you needed to attack to defeat the Zibarians in that exact combination with that exact number of troops and munitions? The leaders all looked at each other in confusion. Listener, I don't think we understand the question. For a brief second, it almost looked like they were being genuine. If they needed to embarrass itself by pointing out how much better the humans were at making predictions before they would help her, so be it. How did your seers know where to send your military? How did you know to prepare for this war for over 30 years? And what do we need to do to be as half as good as you? What do you mean, seers? The dark-skinned woman from the northwestern continent asked. Malbrus decided to try a different approach. Could you, as if I were a mentally deficient child, walk me through the process by which you prepared for the and won the war? The leaders seemed shocked at this, almost as if they hadn't expected it. After a few moments, the heavy-set man from the region in the center of the planetary map spoke. Well, your holiness, we are... Uh, 
We sent out a lot of probes into deep space, mining ships mostly, but some survey vessels. We found one of your ships, All Souls Lost, managed to figure out how your FTL and your communication systems worked, then send a message. Yes, I understand that part. What I don't understand is how you knew where to look. We didn't. It was pure chance. So you're telling me that you found that ship by accident, with no help from your seers or oracles. We, uh, we, we don't have any of those. Come again? Oh, uh, we don't have seers or oracles. Well, we have some people who claim to know the future, but they're just con artists. Some companies made some predictive software that suggests future purchases to consumers. I is that what you mean? Uh, a mechanical seers. We, we haven't got that far yet, but it's to know we're going in the right direction. So how do they do it? They, uh, look at the past preferences and purchases and make guesses? Malbras was stunned by the revelation. That's it. They just guessed, based on the past. Uh, yes. So then, if that's the best you have, how did you know you needed such a large fleet to fight the Zerbarians? We didn't, replied the tanned man. So then how, by the blessed name of the oracles, did you have such a large fleet? Because we just did. Why? This time, the dark-skinned woman was the first to reply. In case we needed to defend ourselves from unfriendly neighbors. Before Malbras could reply, the man representing the southeastern part of the world scoffed at her statement. Oh, please, Jane. We all know your military-industrial complex is just a job program by another name. Don't blame me. It's not my fault the Appropriations Committee are such chicken shits that they succumb to the Rathion's threats about moving factories out of your home state. Mr. Congressman, we would hate for you to be responsible for unemployment and for us to have to fund your opponent's election campaign. But hey, at least the guns ended up being useful for something. Before the politicians could continue bickering, Melbrus interrupted. So, let me make sure I understand this. Not only did you have no idea that they were going to fight a war at any point in the future, you simply spent untold amounts of resources to amass weapons simply as a way to lower unemployment? No, of course not. The dark-skinned man responsible for the central landmass. It was also a deterrent, as well as a massive dick-swinging contest. A deterrent against who? screeched the listener. You weren't even aware of there were more races in the galaxy until you found that ship. The same man replied, as if the answer was obvious, Uh, against each other, of course. But you weren't at war with each other. Exactly, because of the deterrence. How do you prevent war amongst your people? Maldras finally understood. This wasn't a show of power by a superior civilization. This wasn't a grandiose reminder that the Zilbarians were inferior. These were a bunch of primates without any way to concretely determine the future. The guards were armed just because something might happen. They were surprised she came alone and unarmed because they had no idea she would live or die on this trip. The reason they allowed alcohol consumption amongst their people was because they didn't have any foresight to lose. They played guessing games simply because they didn't know what was going to happen. They were a sad race of blind, paranoid, lost imbeciles. Imbeciles who in their ignorance by pure chance managed to find her people, managed to reverse FTL in less than a galactic decade and destroyed the Zibarians. How did you win the war? Pardon? The war. How did you win the war? How did you know where to send your fleets? What maneuvers to execute? Which plans to succeed? Uh, experience. Against who? Each other? She couldn't believe it when everyone in the room nodded. At least some had the decency to look sheepish. Then why did you even name the station after an oracle? Now everyone in the room seemed puzzled. Uh, what do you mean? Delphi Station. It's named after Oracle of Delphi, one of your seers. How can you claim that she was a fraud when you name a station after her? This time, it was the mayor of the station who spoke. The temple of the Oracle was built on top of a pocket of gas. She would inhale the vapors and experience drug-addled visions, and people back then would take these seriously. So, why name the station after her? It's not. There must be some issues with your translation, listener. It is named Delhi Station, not Delphi Station. It's named to remember the city of Delhi. Why? Because it got destroyed in a terrorist plot by fanatics using a series of nuclear weapons. We wish that we were seers and oracles, so that we could have prevented it from happening. We didn't. So now we look to the future so it doesn't happen again. Malbrus finally understood why the station had so many point defense turrets. Why these people had amassed such armaments of devastation. Why, unlike her people, who only prepared for war when they foretold it, the humans were always ready to kill millions at a moment's notice. She finally understood the letters carved above the door leading into the office. 
It is better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Andrew Cole. Thank you very much.